May I wish you a very happy Christmas from here at All Souls in London. We are continuing our series of Christmas online services where we are introducing you to some of the riches in our archive. So we're looking in the centenary year of John Stott's birth. We're looking back at some of his Christmas messages from the decades. So before I read our Bible reading for this morning, I'm going to read a verse. This is what the angel said to the shepherds. Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Our reading is from John chapter 3, and I'm going to start reading at verse 11. John chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. 11. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. I do want to share with you immediately what is uh, on my mind and on my heart and has been in preparing to speak to you this morning. <clears throat> and that is that there are many attempts all around us in our culture to rob us of the significance of Christmas. There are those who want to change it into something that it was never intended to be. And there are those who are trying to twist it out of shape until really it becomes unrecognizable. Some are determined to secularize Christmas, keeping the celebration long after there is anything left to celebrate, except perhaps the myth of Santa Claus. Others are determined to commercialize Christmas, to turn it into a shopping spree, followed by an almighty nosh up and booze up and then of course afterwards the appalling hangover. Then there are others who are determined to sentimentalize Christmas. They keep the pretty story of a baby lying in his mother's arms. They gather the kids round the Christmas tree and sing away in a manger but they don't stop to ask who the baby is or why he's there or what on earth he's got to do with us, or we have got to do with him. So my concern this morning is, how do we reclaim Christmas for what it is intended to be? How can we penetrate into the heart of its mystery? I've often thought that one of the carols that encapsulates the meaning of Christmas better than any others is a line that comes in Mrs. Alexander's famous once in Royal David City where she has the phrase, He came down to earth from heaven. Now, it wouldn't be difficult to find texts in the New Testament which affirm this and from which indeed she has taken the phrase. I think, for example, in John's Gospel of chapter 3, verse 13, where Jesus is recorded as having said in his public ministry, Nobody has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Or again, he said in chapter 6 of John's Gospel, verse 38, I have come down from heaven in order to do the will of my Father. Or again, John 6, verse 51, I am the living bread 
that came down from heaven. He came down to earth from heaven. Now, of course, that up and down language of the New Testament was ridiculed by theologians in the 1960s, if some of you are old enough to remember that decade, the decade of secular theology, when Bishop John Robinson, no less in his famous, notorious book, uh, Honest to God, declared that it was absurd to think of a God up there who might on one occasion have come down here. The up and down story of Christmas was lampooned by him. And it was around that time that Yuri Gagarin, the famous uh, Soviet cosmonaut, thought himself very smart when he announced to the world that he'd gone up into space but had failed to find God there. But friends, you and I know very well that the up and down language of the New Testament was never intended to be taken literally. It was always intended as being symbolic of the great truth of the Incarnation. Namely, that our God humbled himself to become a human being like us. That he condescended to our level that he involved himself in our world and that he became one of us. It's just ten years ago, you may remember, since Lord Louis Mountbatten was so tragically assassinated by an IRA bomb on his yacht. When soon after he was buried in Westminster Abbey, there were some BBC people there who were quizzing some of his former men who'd served under him in Burma. And the BBC reporter said, what did you think of Mountbatten? He was the greatest Englishman since Nelson, one replied. Yeah, but what was the secret of his greatness? And this was their response. He was one of us. He brought himself down to our level and became one of us. And if that was so remarkable for a great man like Lord Man Mountbatten, how much more amazing is it that our God should come down to our level and become one of us? So I want to ask you to meditate on the significance of that with me this morning and to consider what a stimulus this is to our Christian living when we remember the meaning of the Incarnation, that God became one of us. Firstly, it is a stimulus to our worship, which is why we've come to church this morning and will do again, I'm sure, tomorrow. The God we worship is not a God who stood on his dignity and kept himself detached and aloof the God we worship is the God who came down to earth from heaven in order to be one of us. The Incarnation has been described as the most spectacular instance of cultural identification in the whole history of humankind. That the God of highest heaven identified himself with the culture of humanity on earth. The Son of God did not stay in the safe immunity of his heaven. He didn't remain aloof from the pain and the tragedy of the world. He didn't regard equality with God a privilege to be enjoyed selfishly or exploited or monopolized. He emptied himself of his glory and humbled himself to serve. He actually entered into our world. The Incarnation was a daring and a dangerous experiment. But there is something more than that. When he came into our world, he did not step into the human arena like Superman, coming indeed to rescue us, but arriving full-grown invincible, invulnerable, and always an outsider. 
That's what the Jewish world hoped the Messiah would be in his invincibility and vulnerability. But that's not what he'd come to be at all. You know George MacDonald's beautiful poem, or this verse from it? They all were looking for a king to slay their foes and lift them high. Thou camest a little baby thing that made a woman cry. And so then he took our nature and accepted our limitations, made himself vulnerable in his humanity, exposing himself to our temptations, experiencing the bitterness of our sorrows. He lived our life, he bore our sin, he died our death. It was total identification, though without any loss of his own identity. And it is, I think, the, the depth of his descent into our human reality that is so immensely impressive. It is the completeness with which he renounced his own privilege in order to identify with the unprivileged. It involved a sensational reversal of situations. Let me enlarge on that a little bit. Reflect on it with me. To begin with, he became a baby. He who had been the creator of the universe was now himself a creature of time and space. He who had set the universe in motion was now wrapped so tightly in swaddling clothes that he couldn't move his own little finger, let alone the universe. And he who was the word of God, the speech of God, was himself now speechless, except maybe for a few incoherent gurgles. And he on whom all things depend, was now himself helplessly dependent upon a human mother. The Almighty had become powerless. But he was not only a baby, he was a baby, became one in mysterious circumstances. Because it was evident that he was conceived before his parents had got married. And so he exposed himself to the gossip that he was illegitimate, which gave rise to the jibe that we read in the Gospels when somebody said to him, you were altogether born in sin. And then next he became a Jewish baby, which brought upon him the scorn of the whole Gentile world. Then he became a Palestinian Jewish baby, so that he belonged to an oppressed community under the heel of the tyrannical regime of Rome. And then he became a refugee baby in Egypt, prophetic of the fact that throughout his public ministry he had nowhere to lay his head. And then finally he became a baby destined to die for the sins of the world, so that he allowed himself to be unjustly arrested, tried, mocked, spat upon, condemned, flogged, and crucified, and in the God-forsaken darkness bore our sin and judgment in his own innocent body. So he was a victim of gross injustice. He sympathizes with many who are in that position today. Here is evidence of the profound entry into our human reality that the Son of God deliberately experienced. He came down to earth from heaven into poverty, into powerlessness, into scorn and rejection, into injustice and pain and sin and even death. There was no human experience that Jesus shirked 
It was total identification with us in our humanity. What's your reaction? Does it not call forth afresh, however familiar you may be with the story, as I am too, does it not call from us afresh our wondering worship that he should have come from the heights of glory deep down into our human experience on earth. He came down to earth from heaven. It's a stimulus to our worship. But then secondly, it is a stimulus to faith in this respect that there is no stumbling block to faith like the problem of why the innocent suffer. We watch on our television screens, we read in the newspapers and so on, the agony that so many are experiencing this very Christmas. We think of the emaciated bodies of the starving people in Ethiopia again. We think of neglected and abused and battered children. We think of the indignities of poverty, the plight of the homeless and the hopeless, and those who've lost loved ones in the thousands who've been massacred in Romania. The cry is wrung from our lips, why does God allow these things to happen? Why doesn't God do something? And even as we frame the question, its answer begins to be framed in our hearts that God has done something. He came down to earth from heaven. He has entered into our world. He's not only seen our human misery, he has experienced it and experiences it still. Some of you know that I had the privilege of being in Brazil in August and September. When I was in Rio de Janeiro, I saw again the famous Christ of Corcovado. You know that huge statue of Christ, 2,300 and some feet above sea level, with his arms outstretched, the statue as he, as it were, in blessing upon Rio. And I remembered again having read in, I think, a novel of somebody who imagined a poor man from the favelas, the slums of Rio, climbing laboriously up to this colossal statue of Christ of Corcovado and saying to him, I have climbed up to you, Christ, from the filthy confined quarters down there in the slums in order to put to you most respectfully, these considerations. There are 900,000 of us down there in the slums of that splendid city, and you, Christ, do you remain up here at Corcovado, surrounded by divine glory? Go down into those favelas. Come down with me into the slums and live with us down there. Don't stay away and aloof from us up here. Live among us and give us a new faith in yourself and in the Father. And we can imagine how Jesus would have replied to that appeal, but I did come down, and I have never left the slums in which you live. He knows the sufferings of human beings. He is not aloof and away from it. In Asia, I've sometimes visited Buddhist temples. I think of some in Sri Lanka, in Burma, in Thailand, and I've stood respectfully before the statue of the Buddha, his legs crossed, his arms folded, his eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing round his lips and mouth, himself withdrawn from the real world of desire and suffering into a fantasy world remote from human reality. And as I've gazed on the statue of the Buddha, I've not been able to stand it for more than a few minutes. I felt obliged to turn away. 
Because how in a world of pain could one worship a God who is immune to it? And I have turned instead in my imagination to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nailed through hands and feet, back torn, limbs wrenched, forehead bleeding, tormented by thirst, plunged into God-forsaken darkness. And I've said to myself, that is the God for me. He entered into our world of pain. He suffered and died for us. I tell you frankly, my friends, I couldn't believe in God at all if it were not for the Incarnation and the Cross. It is that entering into our humanity and entering into our sin, guilt, and judgment which is the justification of God. It is not only that by the cross he justifies us, it is that he justifies himself by entering into our suffering. P.T. Forsyth put it in this way when he said the cross is God's only self-justification in a world like ours. I'll give you one other example, if I may. You may know the name of uh, Edward Shillito, who was profoundly disturbed during the First World War by the carnage and the bloodshed in the trenches, but who found some comfort in the sufferings of human beings when he remembered that after the resurrection, Jesus showed his disciples his scars. And Edward Shillito wrote the poem called Jesus of the Scars. And here is some of it. If we have never sought, we seek you now. Your eyes burn through the dark, our only stars. We must have sight of thorn marks on your brow. We must have you, O Jesus of the scars. The heavens frighten us. They are too calm. In all the universe there is no place. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the balm? Lord Jesus, by your scars we know your grace. The other gods were strong, but you were small and weak. They rode, but you did stumble to a throne. But to our wounds only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but you alone. So the Incarnation and the cross to which it led are a stimulus to worship and a stimulus to faith as we learn to look upon all the tragedies of life from the vantage ground called Calvary. And thirdly, the cross and the, the Incarnation and the cross are also a stimulus to mission. Because I think you will remember that twice once in prayer and once in commission, Jesus said, As the Father sent me into the world, so I send you into the world. In other words, he made his mission in the world the model of our mission to which we as Christian people are called. So that as he entered into our world, he calls us to enter into other people's worlds. Mission and incarnation belong inseparably together and no mission is authentically Christian that is not incarnational. How can we hope to reach people for Christ unless we enter into their world in order to reach them? We have to enter into their thought world. Most of us are too quick to start witnessing we speak before we have ever listened. But if we are to share the gospel with people in such a way that it resonates with them where they are, then we've got first to listen to them before we dare to speak. We have to struggle to understand their objections to the gospel, their misunderstandings, the obstacles to faith 
and their own alien world view. We have to enter into their thought world. And then we have to enter into their heart world. The world of their feelings, of their alienation and pain, their anger, their emptiness, in order to reach them for Christ where they are. I've sometimes quoted a phrase I've always liked from Michael Ramsey, former Archbishop of Canterbury, who died two or three years ago, when he said, we state and commend the faith, that is, we evangelize, we bear witness to Christ, only insofar as we go out and put ourselves with loving sympathy inside the doubts of the doubter, the questions of the questioner, and the loneliness of those who have lost the way. That's incarnational evangelism, entering into their worlds as he entered into ours. So let me conclude. The only way to rescue Christmas from all those people around us who are seeking to trivialize it is to reinstate it as the festival of the Incarnation in which we celebrate a God who became a human being in Jesus Christ, a God who in Christ came down from, to earth from heaven. And once the Incarnation has become to us the profound reality in our lives, which it is and should be, then we're ready to worship God why our whole life becomes a God-centered life in gratitude for him who came down where we are in order to lift us to where he is. That would have been impossible without an incarnation. We're ready not only to worship him, but to trust him, even in the tragedies and the miseries of the world, knowing that he is a God who suffered and who suffers still. And then we shall imitate him, entering other people's worlds as he entered ours. Friends, we need to come down as he came down. We need to come down from our lofty pedestals as he came down from his. We need to come down from our high horses of dignity and remoteness and detachment as he came down into our world. We have to make ourselves vulnerable. We have to be willing to get our feet wet and our hands dirty. We have to know what it is to feel with the suffering world and weep with those that weep. All this and more is involved in the central Christian affirmation that the Word was made flesh. The eternal Son of God became a human being. He came down to earth from heaven. Let us remain seated and pray for a few moments. We'll be silent in prayer for a moment or two. It may be you wish to offer him your worship Ask him to reinforce your faith. Maybe you wish to ask that we may be involved in true incarnational mission. Let's pray to him ourselves in quietness. Lord Jesus Christ, we are glad and grateful that we've had the opportunity to reflect together on what it meant for you to come down to earth from heaven, to identify yourself with us, to involve yourself in our world. We pray that you will stimulate our worship and faith and that you will enable us in days to come to imitate you in your mission, entering deeply into other people's worlds as you entered into ours. Hear our prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory of your great and worthy name. Amen.
Thank you very much for joining us for our Christmas online service. We have two more services like this. So on Sunday the 26th, tomorrow, and then on the 2nd of January. I'm going to finish with the prayer set in the Church of England for Christmas Day. Almighty God, who has given us your only begotten Son to take our nature upon him, and as at this time to be born of a pure virgin, grant that we, being regenerate and made your children by adoption and grace, may daily be renewed by your Holy Spirit. Through the same our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the same Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. So may he who by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and heavenly, fill you with the sweetness of inward peace and goodwill, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.